It was on December 27th, 2019 that the world was changed forever when the Russian Federation placed its first hypersonic missile, the Avangard, into combat service. Tested just south of the Ural Mountains in Russia, this missile was shown to be far more deadly and precise than other weapons carried by militaries throughout the world, hitting a target 6,000 kilometers away. But what do we truly know about hypersonic missiles and the new arms race the Avangard has brought about with its inception? Well, whether you're a fan of all things technological or just want to know more about the weapon that can blow us all to kingdom come, stay right where you are, as we're about to explore everything there is to know about the rise of hypersonic missiles. So strap yourself in and get ready for a bumpy ride, things are about to get scary. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe with notifications turned on so you don't miss any of the new videos we post. What are hypersonic missiles? Although the Avangard has been called a hypersonic missile by next to everyone in the world, experts in the field have indicated that it is less of a missile and more of what they call a hypersonic boost glide weapon, and may thus result in a hypersonic arms race of sorts between major powers of the United States, Russia, and China. So why draw a distinction between the avant-garde and our classic understanding of missiles? Well, as human beings, we feel the need to categorize everything we discover and make in the world. As such, flying objects such as missiles can be placed in one of three groups, being subsonic, supersonic, and hypersonic. Sub Subsonic missiles are the slowest type and travel at less than the speed of sound, otherwise known as Mach 1. And all this speed in kilometers varies greatly depending on variables like altitude and temperature, it can generally be regarded as around 1,000 kilometers per hour. Supersonic missiles, on the other hand, fly faster than the speed of sound that can reach up to Mach 5, which is, in layman's terms, five times the speed of sound. Anything faster than Mach 5, or for simplicity's sake, 5,000 kilometers per hour, falls into the category of hyper Hypersonic. This means that a hypersonic missile could travel around 1 to 5 miles per second, traveling from Los Angeles to New York in just under 8 minutes. And as you're well aware, the faster a missile is, the less time the inhabitants of a targeted area have to prepare for impact, often resulting in a greater loss of lives. This makes hypersonic missiles incredibly dangerous. How accurate are hypersonic missiles? It's not just the speed of a hypersonic missile that makes it so incredibly dangerous, though, but the pinpoint accuracy that that it tends to have at its disposal. To fully understand this, we have to turn to the principle of circular error probable, or CEP, which is described as the measure of a weapon system's precision. This is defined as the radius of a circle that has been drawn around the landing spots of all testers of that weapon. If we were talking about the CEP of a submachine gun, for example, we would refer to it as the spread of the weapon when someone holds their finger on the trigger. When it comes to missiles and rockets, however, it refers to the space within and which all testers have landed. Older ballistic missiles are not as agile as these new hypersonic missiles, often rising and falling in predictable arcs. This meant that the CEPs of these older missiles were quite low, especially when compared to the hypersonic missiles of today. The Minuteman 3, for example, which acts as the backbone for the majority of the nuclear arsenal of the United States, has a CEP of around 120 meters. In simplified terms, this means that only half of the missiles fired are likely to hit the one 120 meter mark, with the remainder falling somewhere close to, but outside of this zone. This is all fine and well when you're trying to take out an enemy military post which is large in size, but wouldn't be too successful if aiming for moving targets such as a boat or cargo aircraft. For these smaller moving objects, militaries often use what are referred to as standard cruise missiles, as these have a CEP of around 10 meters. These missiles are, however, quite slow in the broader scheme of things, clocking in at around 800 kilometers per hour. Hypersonic missiles, on the other hand, tend to take the very best of both worlds by combining the incredible speed of ballistic missiles with the precision and accuracy of cruise missiles. How precise are we talking here? Well, that depends on the hypersonic missile itself. The different types of hypersonic missiles. The first form a hypersonic missile can take is that of a hypersonic cruise missile, or HCM. This hypersonic variant differs in that it is powered all the way to the target by rocket propulsion technology. DARPA in the United States is currently testing something known as the Wave Rider, which is a clear example of this type of hypersonic cruise missile. Although these are, essentially speaking, faster versions of cruise missiles like the Tomahawk, HCMs can be launched from the ground, air, or sea, and will most likely be able to reach Mach 4 or 5 before the revolutionary air-breathing engine on board takes over. This engine, known as a supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet for short, works by compressing supersonic incoming air before the combustion stage 
stage, allowing the engine to operate at extremely high speeds. These hypersonic cruise missiles would fly through the air at an altitude of around 20 to 30 kilometers, and would thus need to make use of their incredible maneuverability to avoid any barriers on their way to the target. The second type of hypersonic missile comes in the form of a hypersonic glide vehicle, or HGV. These types of missiles are launched from rockets until they reach the upper atmosphere of the Earth, cruising at altitudes anywhere between 50 and 100 kilometers. The HGV will then glide across the upper atmosphere until the target, gliding down when ready. What makes these hypersonic missiles so dangerous, however, is the inability for current defense systems to counter them. Unlike ballistic missiles of the past, which have a very predictable trajectory and can be thus shot out of the sky or avoided when possible, HGVs have a very unpredictable trajectory, making their targeting impossible. HGVs also spend around 80% of their time below the detection radius of enemy ground radar units, which means that more often than not, enemies only realize they are being targeted when it's too late to do anything about it anyways. So now that Russia has their hands on the first step in hypersonic missiles, does the rest of the world have anything to worry about? What are the safety concerns going forward? The Nuclear Threat Initiative Organization, or NTI for short, put out a report that estimates that a full 23 minutes would be required for the United States to respond to an incoming missile attack from the Russian Federation. After a minute of flight, U.S. space satellites would detect the launch of the missile, with ground units confirming the detection of this launch around two minutes after launch. By minute three, NORAD would have assessed this information and, after confirming that the threat is indeed real, would have alerted the White House by minute four. At seven minutes after, the president and his advisors would be assembled and briefed on the situation to determine what response should take place in respect of the launch. After deliberating for only five minutes, a decision would have to be made at only 12 minutes after the launch. If the decision to respond results in a retaliatory launch, this would have to be communicated and transmitted, which usually takes place at the 15-minute mark after launch. But it is only at around 20 minutes after launch that the launch office receives, decodes, and authenticates these orders to retaliate. A whole three minutes later, and the retaliatory missiles are launched by the U.S. This is the timeline that the NTI has set up for the U.S. if push does end up coming to shove, but realistically speaking, we could be looking at a lot longer. This means that a hypersonic missile would be able to travel the distance of around 4,000 kilometers in this very same time frame, which the Americans out there will be able to picture by imagining the distance between San Francisco and New York City. Well, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, a hypersonic missile will be able to travel from coast to coast of North America in the same time period as it would take to make the decision to retaliate. This means that world governments might need to consider placing more trust in automated missile responses, as human intervention just appears to be too slow to make the decisions necessary to prevent a hypersonic attack. This in its own right is a dangerous act, though, as it brings about quite a few security concerns. The United States has worked hard to keep their retaliation procedures as physical as possible as to avoid avoid interference by external forces, after all. Suffice it to say, replacing this physical procedure with one that is electronic, although faster, does present security issues by opening the system up to the criminal act of hacking. There are already examples of hackers breaking into the systems of self-driving cars to induce accidents, so although this might be a necessary step, it may also be a dangerous one. Carrying Capacity From a quick look at the avant-garde, you can tell that it has been created with the purpose of carrying a load to increase the radius of its blast. From explosives to nuclear warheads, once more, the sky's the limit when it comes to the carrying capacity of a hypersonic missile. That being said, the majority of such missiles wouldn't even need to carry any external explosive or warhead to deal a large amount of damage. Remember, as an object, the missile is traveling at well over 5,000 kilometers per hour. At 10,000 kilometers per hour, for example, a one kilogram ball has more kinetic energy built up than an entire kilogram of TNT. Up the mass even more at you'll find the amount of TNT in question to quadruple, leading to an intense explosion without having to waste any further armaments. Why is it taking so long to create hypersonic missiles? Well, since the idea of a hypersonic missile has been in the works ever since the onset of World War II, it seems almost impossible that it would have taken humanity so long to create the first workable hypersonic variant. But when you consider that the lift-to-drag ratio of these missiles are as often as high as 2 to 1, and compare this to the lift-to-drag to drag ratio of space shuttles at one to one, you realize just how incredible of a feat this was. So what do you think of the avant-garde? Feel free to let us know in the comment section 